Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker this morning, Dr. Sanjaya Mitra, uh, who is unknown to some of you, but known to some of you. Dr. Mitra uh, is one of our esteemed experts on OER. He has joined COAL headquarters here in Canada last year, uh, two years ago, uh, in January 2013. And before that, he worked in Delhi in Cole's Tenka office as the director. Um, prior to that, he was also working in Paris at UNESCO, uh, where he was the program specialist ICT in education, science, and culture. Dr. Mishra has over 25 years of experience in design, development, and management of OD ODL programs. And with a blend of academic and professional qualifications in library and information science, distance education, television production, and training and development, he has been promoting the use of educational multimedia, e-learning, and the use of open education resources and open access to scientific information around the world. Since his service, since during his service in different capacities at the Indira Gandhi National Open University in India, amongst many innovative activities and programs, he developed the OER-based one-year postgraduate diploma in e-learning. Dr. Mishra has received various awards, one of which was the ICT ISTD Vivekanand National Award for Excellence in Human Resource Development and Training in 2007. He is involved in developing technology enabled solutions for increasing the quality of and access to educational opportunities at all levels. Dr. Michel's vision is to unleash the potentials of every learner by providing and enabling by providing an enabling environment for excellence through innovative use of educational technologies. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Mishra to speak to us. He is waiting, he's very excited. He cannot wait to speak to you because this topic is very close to his heart. And we are very really pleased to have him speaking to us this morning because for us in the work that we are doing, open education resources is indeed very important because we do not want to reinvent the wheel. We want to make sure that we are using materials that can help us to stretch our dollars. And in a way, this is what OER can also do for us. So welcome to the session. Uh, welcome, Dr. Mishra. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. And thank you to the Girls Inspire team. You have always been inspiring um, as ever since the project uh, has initiated a call. And I have been a, an observer, a bystander, looking at things that are happening. And um, I'm always proud of the things that the, your team has been doing. So congratulations to the team at call and elsewhere. And, I welcome you all, our partners, uh, joining from different locations for this webinar today. Um, it's my pleasure and, uh, to be uh, a speaker uh, today. Um, some of the things that I'll be talking, uh, some of you may be knowing, and I know Professor Mustafa, who is one of my close associates in Bangladesh, is also there. Um, so it's some of the things may not be new to him and to many others, but it's always good to uh, uh, to talk about some common issues that we all believe in and work together as a Commonwealth team. Uh, so its e reputation is good in open and distance learning that we always tell, that helps re-emphasize uh, or internalize our learning process. So my, uh, the presentation today is using open educational resources to 
expand access to education and training for marginalized groups. And within that context uh, of the work that we are doing, it's uh, a very basic uh, kind of guide or basic issues around open educational resources, uh, explaining what it is, what kind of things it can do, how you as an individual can contribute to creation and use and reuse of open educational resources. Some of those things, uh, uh, some of the things so I will be touching upon in the presentation and particularly to uh, answer to your questions that you might have at the end. Um, going next uh, uh, to the biggest challenges. What are the biggest challenges that we have today? Uh, millions, uh, uh, particularly in the marginalized groups, uh, having la uh, lacked basic resources. For example, uh, in 2012, in low-income countries, uh, only 28% had access to sanitation facilities, 25% to electricity, and 67% uh, made it to the last grade of primary education. Gender equality is a long way off. Uh, women in many countries do uh, at least twice as much paid work as men do. Uh, education also needs uh, to keep up with labor market needs. Uh, uh, by 2020, the world could have 40 million too few workers with tertiary education uh, related to uh, the demand. So the pressure on education for all these things are much, but on current trends, if you look at, uh, we are not going to achieve uh, a universal primary education. Um, it will be achieved by 2042, in a lower secondary education will be about 2059 and universal upper secondary education by 2084, I think which is a long way. Many of us would not be alive to see those good results by then. Uh, in 2014, uh, 263 million children, adolescents are out of schools and these are the major challenges. Uh, some, some of the major uh, development challenges we all are facing with. Um, the advantage is for education. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of research and things uh, that tells us education can help increase agriculture productivity. Um, it improves health and reduces uh, fertility rates. Uh, tertiary education uh, helps sustain and expand high skill occupations. So I think focusing on education, one of the things that we focus uh, on sustainable development goals is that if you are focusing on education, in fact we are focusing on all other goals. Goal four may be focusing on education on SDG, but if you are strengthen goal four, achievement of goal four, we are actually going to have impact on all other sustainable go development goals. That's what I call as an advantage education for us. Um, but with having said advantage education, access to educational opportunities and materials are a problem. Just to give a couple of examples here that students don't have access to reading test books. An example is in 2012 in Cameroon, um, for, for one test book there were 12 students for reading and for one mathematics test book there are 14 students to make use of. Same in Togo. Um, there were three students for every reading book, a test book, compared with eight students for every mathematics test book. Uh, we did recently a study with uh, Pro Professor Mustafa that on an average higher education students in Bangladesh spends about 1,850 Bangladesh taka per year for books and supplies. Another study we have done recently in Malaysia which tells that 76 uh, percent learners don't buy test books because of the high, uh, high cost of the test book. So access to educational material, access to education is a problem in many parts of the country uh, or the world. In fact, in, even in the developing world, in the United States, for example, I would say that um, students spend about 1200 US dollars per year to buy test books. Um, about 65% of students inform that their grade levels are affected due to non-purchase of test books. They don't buy test books and that's how they're uh, affected. Um, 
over 5.2 million students uh, use financial aid to purchase textbooks in the United States. So it's not a problem in the developing world. Uh, it's a problem everywhere that the cost of textbooks and education is, is increasing faster than uh, uh, people can afford to. And that's a concern uh, uh, looking into the big challenges that we have, big educational challenges we have. So the one of the solutions uh, that have, people have been talking about is open educational resources. And, and that's the, the, the uh, topic of the, the presentation today. So just let me give you some brief history about that from where it started. In 1999, uh, Rice University started a project to create test books online uh, and it was named Core Connections. And now it is, of course, OpenStask. If you find online, you will find OpenStask. Um, followed by that, MIT OpenCourseWare, which is a much hyped and more successful project in 2001 started. And it, that led to, those development led to uh, the UNESCO taking note of those development and created a forum in 2002, uh, two, which actually created the term open educational resources. And in 2012, uh, Commonwealth of Learning uh, and the UNESCO organized the World OER Congress that led to uh, OER Paris uh, Declaration uh, 2012. 2017 is interestingly being um, uh, celebrated around the world as the year of open. And what's this year of open is about? Why, why it is being celebrated? Now, as you know, 2012, 15 years ago, open educational resources term was created. Um, a, another movement called open access movement, which also started uh, um, on the same uh, time, which uh, Budapest Open Access Initiative was launched 15 years back as well. Um, uh, Creative Commons uh, was was started um, uh, around that same time. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, uh, Cape Town Declaration on Open Educational Resources uh, uh, happened uh, in in 2007, uh, and of course 2012, uh, five years ago, OER Paris Declaration was adopted. So it's a kind of a coincidence of of 15 years, 10 years, and five years of different movements related to open uh, openness in educational landscape that happened and it, uh, the world community is celebrating this. Uh, toward the end of the, the year um, and, and the last last quarter of the year in September, uh, the second World OER Congress is happening uh, and, and, and we have recently completed six regional consultations on uh, the status of open educational resources. Uh, around, around the world. So a lot of things are happening. Um, having said this, let me go into uh, the definition of open educational resources, the way it is used um, and the way, the way we, we look at. OER are teaching, learning and research materials in any medium that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits uh, re free use and in some instance repurposing by others. What does it really mean? There are two key terms to, to focus here, public domain and open license. Public domain to many of us in, in layperson's language is that anything available on the web is in the public domain to a large extent. But for the definition purpose and for the technical region and legally public domain has a specific meaning to it. Uh, public domain uh, means uh, here anything that is copyright expired. And we know that copyright uh, laws are different in different con uh, countries. And But mostly copyright expiry happens either 50 years post death of the author or 60 years post death of the author. So copyright expiry. For example, I'll give example of Shakespeare's work as something that is on OER because uh, of that copyright expiry. The second uh, aspect of uh, what is public domain is if the author relinquishes the right. If you have created something and you relinquish the right to the public, then okay, you may not attribute myself for this work and I don't think this is, I, I'm expecting anything. Then 
that material is public domain. So a material has to be in public domain or open license. And open license is the key here. And we'll be knowing a little more about the open license. What is open license a little later. So if a material is released with an open license or available in the public domain, then that material is OER. What is open here? Now, one of the proponent, early proponent of open ed, um, education, open educational resources is David Way, and he speaks about uh, five R's, reuse, revise, remix, redistribute, and retain as the components of open license. If an open license allows you to reuse, revise, remix, redistribute, and retain the license, that you, the, retain the copies that you do, what it entails is that you don't have to seek permission from the copyright holder to reuse or remix or do anything with those materials. Um, it's, it, it allows you to, to it, uh, anyone, once you release a material in OER, anyone else, I can take your material and reuse or revise, remix. Uh, remix means I can take some material prepared by Francis, I can take some material prepared by Dr. Mustafa and create something else, I create a new derivative and share. So that's that's the whole spirit of uh, um, with doing things without asking uh, the permission. The issue is to understand uh, why OER, and this is the bigger bigger picture that we everyone should ask ourselves. Uh, I normally give three uh, regions of using OER, which I say reduces cost, uh, enhances access, and improves quality. But corollary to that is I always say that the people who are using OER, they must ask these questions, uh, reduce cost for whom? Is it for the student or is it for the organization that is providing? Or it may be for the both. Enhance access. Enhance access to what? Enhance access to the resource or enhance access to a degree or a certification program or enhance access to lifelong learning. Now, those are the kind of questions you need to ask to position ourselves uh, in the world of OER, the work we do. Improves quality, yes. This is certainly improved quality, but how is important to look at? Um, a, a, a test book by itself doesn't really improve quality. Um, no, nevertheless, the material that you produce might be of good quality because of uh, it, uh, several people uh, have been involved as a teamwork production, or it has been improved upon, upon several materials that has been, uh, been developed previously. So in a way, the material might be of high quality, but does it really improve quality? How, how the quality will get improved? It's, that, those are the issues that need to be looked at when deploying OER. So it's just not talking about creation of OER, but it's about using OER and deployment of OER. Those questions need to be uh, looked at. The, there are several challenges also to stakeholders, those uh, know, who use OER or who want to use OER. Uh, a, a survey in 2011 talked about uh, teachers' difficulty, learners' problem, what are the technical issues and management issues. It it's comes from a study in OER Asia. And it talks about uh, teachers find it difficult to locate uh, adapt and repurpose OER to their relevant world because learning is contextual. Now a material that is developed somewhere else may not be suitable to, to another place because the cases, the examples that are cited are alien to the learners. But teachers need to adapt those materials and not reinvent the way. So teachers, teachers usually lack where to find materials and how to adapt it. L learners also uh, or normally have to have an open uh, you know, mind not to learn only from the classroom but to learn from whatever resources available. So it's a kind of a, an opportunity to learn from different modes uh, and different resources. Uh, technical standards uh, in those days were a little difficult. So um, for repackaging of OER people were worried about how to do things. Uh, today the, there are many uh, technical tools, easier open source tools available that enables uh, repackaging and reuse of OER much easier than before. 
Uh, but at the same time, there are also issues about um, copyright issues, competitions, and uh, and uh, fee-based courses and others and many institutions. Remember this study was done largely in educational institutions and not in the context that uh, we in Girls Inspire work to a large extent. So, but I wanted to flag this up that OER is not everything good. There are, it also brings several challenges that we need to, if we want to adopt, we need to, need to do those things uh, well. Um, to re-emphasize a little bit, uh, the OER Paris Declaration, what it talks about, it talks about several key recommendations. I think it has about 10 recommendations, but I'm here highlighting three important things that we all together should do it. Foster an awareness of OER. Encourage development of OER in a variety of language and cultural context. I would like to emphasize here the language and cultural context to a large extent because education is, to me, is contextual. If you don't learn in your mother tongue, early early language, uh, early learning doesn't happen in your mother tongue. Uh, it's not going to be as effective uh, um, as we would expect. So, uh, focusing on language and culture while developing OER is an important aspect to us, articulated and emphasized in the OER Paris Declaration. And of course, the third one, which uh, is one of my uh, works that uh, at call that I always push with government is to encourage open licensing of educational materials pub produced with public funds. So what is pub uh, what is developed with public funds need to go back to the public, not proprietary copyrighted by someone else and get get benefit out of that project fund which is public uh, taxpayers result. So these are things that need to be always uh, uh, remembered to advocate about OER. Uh, now, where can we find OER? So now talking about OER is you know, conceptual philosophical practice is okay, but it's important to find OER because you know higher education teachers in 2011 find this difficult that they were not able to find OER. But one of the easy way to find OER is to use uh, search engines, Google for example. Google has a, if you, uh, some of you, if you have used advanced search features in Google, you will find that search by license type is another one. So you can actually select, use the different license type uh, and search. So one of the license type will be uh, modify and share. So you can say, okay, I can modify and share. The other one will be Google will be modify, share, and even commercial. So that's, so you, you have those options to search and then anything results comes, you can go there and then you can look at some, uh, whether these are really open license or not before making use. There are a lot of repositories and some of those are MIT OpenCourseWare, OpenLearn, there are directories like OER Commons and Directory of Open Educational Resources. Uh, the Directory of Open Educational Resources is actually a, a, a product of cumulative learning. You can also find um, photos and videos on Flickr you will have quick, uh, open licenses, Creative Commons licenses there. You will also have videos in YouTube on CCBY license. Um, the, the, uh, Creative, uh, the YouTube licenses are standard licenses and they are copyrighted. But YouTube also provides, if you are uploading videos, you can upload video with CCBY license. So I've come to this, what is this CCBY that I have just referred now. How to recognize uh, OER? Um, one of the way to recognize OER is to look at these symbols in the right hand side. Um, looked at CC uh, and RAM. That's clearly commons uh, inside a circle. Normally, you might have seen copyrighted materials with C within a circle, and those are completely copyrighted materials. Which, if you are reusing um, beyond fair dealing. Uh, of uh, though, uh, someone's work, you need permission. But if a material has these four uh, icons used in the material, then you don't need to uh, take permission. You can take those as OER and reuse for your own purposes. Uh, there are a lot of different platforms I would like to highlight for you. Uh, you can search on Google um, uh, about this sites. There are huge amount, the idea is to say that there are huge amount of learning resources today available uh, as OER. Um, this is just, uh, the, the list that I'm showing here is just uh, a, a 
some of those there are many uh, um, available uh, you you can find materials for different levels of learning it's not just um, uh, you know, grade grade one to twelve it's not just uh, you know higher education or undergraduate education textbooks or or engineering and technology you can actually find wide range of topics uh, on on these sites and you can repurpose those things to your own context okay of course uh, the, the the fair use is to attribute those people but you don't need to take permission from those people because they already allow you to uh, make use of those being in, in open education as open educational resources uh, I would suggest you to look at some of these sites for searching open educational resources. Um, I think I would suggest uh, if the slides can be shared, send it to the partners, they can actually click. This slide has the links. Uh, they can directly go to the li links. They don't have to search uh, on Google, but they can click on this and search. So Google Advanced Search, Creative Commons has a search facility, uh, which is called CC Search, uh, for using images and other things. Uh, one of the uh, the most common thing that I use is CC search. So I search uh, open images for presentation and other things to use from CC search. So uh, you are not paying for images. There are a lot of paid sites, and you but in the same time you can use CC search to get free, uh, equally important graphics from there. Uh, Joram is a site from UK. Expert is from UK. Connecting repositories, uh, base. Uh, free full PDF directory of OER skills commons. I think some of you might be more interested in the skills commons website. So yes, yeah, some of those things uh, I have quickly listed this, but there are a lot many available uh, on 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 the web. Uh, this is a normal question that I get from everyone. Can I contribute to OER? Uh, I think. Uh, to me, anyone can contribute to open educational resources. If you have something that you know, you can contribute to OER. Um, if, uh, it could be a recorded knowledge, it could be a tacit knowledge, uh, but if in order to convert that tacit knowledge to OER, not most uh, commonly I said record it on a video, record it on on, on a audio on the audio, and just just uh, share it with an open license. Uh, remember, anything that you create. Uh, you retain your copyright by default. So even if you are creating an audio program or recording something of your own, you retain your copyright. Unless you share that material with an open license, it won't become OER. So um, in order to make, create OER, the only thing you need to uh, do is to use an open license uh, on your work to tell others that your work is OER. That's it. So you can use any tool, you uh, not text, graphics, audio, video, animation, any tool or a website uh, to uh, create uh, OER. So it's not uh, something different. OER is just about doing everything else as usual, but putting a license conditions to let others that you have allowed others to reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute your work. So that's as simple as I, I would uh, suggest. But what's all about this licensing business? Um, what's that? Um, see, um, as I have been talking about, licensing is at the core of uh, the OER business. Uh, and by default, uh, all learning materials that we create are all rights reserved, thus requires permission. Whereas OER doesn't require permission. So to go a little bit about uh, the licensing issues and copyright. What copyright does? When you create something, uh, by law, um, you, the, uh, you as the original creator, you get credit. That means you get attribution that you are the author or your creator. You can copy it and give it to somebody else. You can redistribute it that nobody will stop. You can license it to someone else uh, to sell or to distribute or do anything. Uh, you can perform, do something. If it is a play, you can do a scenograph, cinema on that, or you you can perform. If it is it is it is a play, uh, you can license somebody else to perform uh, on your behalf, or so many other things that you as the copyright holder can do. Um, if it is not on OER, 
we cannot do any of these things. So the key is, is this. By doing OER, we are allowing others. And as you see the license issue, every copyright law allows the author to license their work. So what it doesn't allow allows if copyright prohibits unauthorized use of distribution, performance, adoption, sale. Copyright law allows some extent in the context of fair use or fair dealing that you can reuse some of those things and do some of the things in our academic work. But uh, sometimes it's uh, it's not clear um, how much you can you can uh, uh, reuse under fair uh, use clause. Uh, but certainly fair use allows you to uh, do criticism, commentary, reporting, uh, research, and other ways. You can do some of the work, but not all. We are looking at, for example, if there is a test books, uh, which is uh, on physics uh, grade 12, uh, which is very good, uh, much everywhere else. What do you want to reinvent with? If it is an OER, you can just reuse that and without creating that material. So that's kind of stuff we are talking about. Open license is all about, uh, it's, it's, it's a movement towards that. Uh, making uh, available teaching and learning resources universally available to all. There are different ways of doing licensing. Um, uh, open content license, GNU free documentation license, open publication license, and there are many, many different types of licenses uh, which can be attributed as open licenses. But um, one of the most commonly used and, and currently kind of a de facto open license is about um, Creative Commons licenses, which I'll come in a while. Um, and what is uh, what the open license is? Uh, it can be applied to any operated content and allows any person to reuse uh, the content without asking permission. Uh, allows anyone worldwide to use a copyrighted work without necessarily having to pay a fee or royalty uh, uh, to that extent. Because when it's a copyrighted work, many people ask for uh, a certain amount of fees or regularly getting royalties for that purpose. Um, and of course, uh, uh, only if a person desires to use a work in a way other than specified in the license, because the open licenses specify certain conditions. If you uh, go beyond the specific conditions of an open license, then you need permission of the of the copyright holder. And as I just said, the most common one is, uh, currently is Creative Commons licensing. And Creative Commons is an organization, it's a non-profit organization in the United States. Uh, it promotes uh, um, reuse of content uh, to, uh, to promote innovate, innovation and creativity. Uh, CC licenses are uh, very flexible. It has uh, six different types of licenses, and of which only four are open licenses, uh, which I will again re-emphasize in a little while. Um, CC licenses, let me re-emphasize uh, re again, are not alternative to copyright. Every material, even if they are released with a CC license or even if they are OER, they do have their own copyright. The copyright is never never uh, thrown away. Copyright is always there. Uh, what it, the CC license makes is that um, allows people to know that this is a copyrighted material, but the author has allowed you to reuse in, in, in different context. The, the six types of licenses of, of Creative Commons are like this. Uh, CCBY, CCBYSA, CCBYNC, CCBYNCSA, CCBYND, and CCBYNCND. You might be wondering what is this BY and SA and C and ND. They are actually those concepts. BY is attribution. Attribution means that if you are using somebody else's work, you must attribute the original creator of that work. That means all the six licenses of Creative Commons uh, makes it sure that the reuser attributes the original creator. Share alike is SA. 
any license that is with this SA need to be shared in the same way. That means the creator is telling that if you reuse my work, I want this sheet to be in share alike in the same way that I have done. So what it does, it creates a chain reaction. That I have created a material in CCBYSA. If you are reusing my material to create another derivative, then you share your derivative on the same license. Non-commercial says that you can do anything with this material, but you cannot sell it. You can't make money out of it. So it's not for commercial purpose. Uh, and ND is telling that you can't really create a derivative about of my material. So you can use as is, but you can't make derivative. As of now, uh, the way open licenses are, are treated, uh, the licenses with ND are not considered OER. They are, provide least freedom, uh, but ND is because it doesn't allow you to repurpose, uh, remix, recreate something based on the original. It, these are not considered OER. However, personally, uh, I have my disagreement on this uh, development and I have been making efforts to, uh, uh, in my own ways, that we should also consider CCBY, uh, the materials with ND licenses as OER because uh, at least it provides access to, uh, to learning materials, access to learning of certain materials. If certain materials are usable, uh, they should also be considered, but technically those are not OER at, uh, as of now. Uh, the, the Creative Commons licenses technically has three uh, the technical issues that allows it to be one of the most commonly used. It has a legal code. The licenses are actually vetted by law, best lawyers around the world. Uh, so they have gone through several legal cases and tests. So there is a level of legal endurance. Uh, there is a common code uh, that is iconic based as you have seen. It makes it a self-explanatory and people can easily understand it. And the third one is that there is a digital code in every uh, license. If you use uh, the, the, the logos uh, the, and, and use the license uh, creation tool from the CC site, uh, then what it provides is, is the search engine to locate a CC rights expression language that allows to search similar license material. Okay. And today there are over 1 billion CC license material on the web. So that's the power of the, 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 the digital code. You can actually go to a license chooser uh, on the website and actually copy and uh, choose, uh, take two steps. Uh, because first it will ask, allow adoption, adoption of your work. So you say yes, no, or as long as they say are alike. Or the second is that you say that are you allow, uh, going to allow commercial uh, use of your work, yes or no? Then it will give you the license of what license you should use. You can copy the code and put it on your website and put in your any material that you want to use. So it's as simple as that. It's not rocket science for that purpose. Um, sometime back, I also created a flowchart to make it uh, make people understand. Uh, I have a three-step approach. This is a manual way of looking at things. So we said, First ask, uh, are you going to permit derivative or not? Um, derivatives permitted or not? So uh, if you say no, you do one way. If you uh, say yes, go one way. Then you ask commercial use permitted or not? Then you will say expect, expect the user to share uh, their work with the same license, yes or no. So each takes you to different route and then you get into uh, the license that you would like to use. So um, I found it more uh, explanatory for people to understand what they are doing rather than uh, a website or machine telling me what I am doing. So this this makes it clear uh, to a user that I am doing with my knowledge of what is happening if I am using this flowchart. That's the, the beauty of the flowchart. Uh, uh, nevertheless, the, the CC license chooser on the Security Commons website is much user friendly. The next thing I will talk about is that if you create OER, do look at the CC license compatibility chart. 
some licenses are compatible with uh, some licenses some licenses are not compatible with some licenses so i think it's uh, good to look at the license compatibility chart uh, while uh, remixing uh, materials with different licenses so um, it's i'm not going into detail on this uh, i would encourage you to uh, look more uh, into different resources that we have uh, at call website um, there is a basic guide to oer and there is a, a, a course, uh, a understanding OER and another publication we have. And there is a very short course on um, OER. Um, it's a short online course, two hours course. So if you would like to uh, spend a little more time on, on this post uh, this presentation, I would encourage you to go to this site called tel.callvee.org and there you will find there is a course on understanding open educational resources. You click it, click that course, and then it will say, give you some technical details, and then you enter the course, and then you are on. Uh, it, it doesn't ask you about email or anything, or user ID or password. Uh, what it will ask you to, when the course starts, it will ask you to type your name. And if you complete the course in one sitting, at the end, uh, you will be asked uh, about 20 questions, and you, complete 80% uh, score, then it will give you a certificate with your name. So you can download that as PDF and print your certificate on an A4 page or you can uh, you can put on your Facebook or anywhere you can tell that you, are, you have now got a certificate on OER from Commonwealth of Learning. So those are the things that I had to say share today and uh, I would like to thank you uh, for uh, this opportunity and uh, I would like to um, uh, respond if you have any questions uh, for me or comments that I would like to learn from you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, uh, Jaya. I know it was super informative. Um, we already had a few questions during the presentation. So I'm going to ask Mustafa, can you read off your first question? Um, Mustafa, are you able to see the phone? Great. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks, uh, Christina, uh, and uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Sanjay Mr. for this nice presentation. Very elaborate, and uh, it was self-explanatory. So I did have that much question, but one thing uh, I was a little bit confused uh, about the fairings. Already he mentioned about this. Uh, so uh, my question was uh, uh, about. Uh, uh, the fair use and uh, is it uh, universal? Is there any universal principle when we go for fair use? Because these are copyrighted. So does the context matters? So for example, in Bangladesh, we have a copyright law. So the fair use uh, should be defined in the copyright law. So if I use something from uh, a material or an article which is published in Sweden, so can we uh, follow a common principle? Uh, to adapt this matrix or take this materials from anywhere. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Mustafa. That's that's a very um, you know, common question and common difficulties in the copyright laws. The fair use or fair dealing principle doesn't really say how much is is fair to use. It says the nature of use um, as such that if you are doing a research work, a citation or a quotation to a work or if you are doing if you are a journalist and you are reporting a research work you are allowed and if you are critiquing your work you are allowed to do that uh, so the, the nature of uses uh, are, are emphasized but the amount of use of the material is not uh, not emphasized not clear and that's where the the open licenses come into picture because pe uh, people uh, are not sure how much if I take, it will be, I will not be sued uh, for breach of copyright. So, in the, and, and those who are creator of learning materials are always uh, in trouble, uh, always in difficulty, uh, that whether I am violating the law. And that's where the open licenses uh, come into it. Um, so, uh, the, this is a tricky question in the sense that there is no thumb rule to follow. Um, uh, in, in, in what is fair use and that's 
uh, makes the copyright laws complex. And therefore, OER and open licenses are, are important. Francis? Sorry, I have a question on the languages. Uh, within the context that we where we are working, uh, there are different languages. So, is there a, a shortcut to finding OER within a specific country in that specific language? So, in Bangladesh, for instance, or Pakistan, or Mozambique, where it's uh, predominantly Portuguese. Uh, how can we? How can you advise uh, our colleagues uh, what avenues to follow in that regard? Yeah, language uh, searching materials in languages, uh, any different language other than English, is always a, a, a problem and tricky thing. Um, there are um, uh, language searches on on Google. Okay, we can we can use that, but not all languages are covered on that. And if you are searching uh, one language, you are getting material in that language alone. You are not getting everything else on that. But uh, I think uh, technologies are not yet uh, rich enough to allow uh, transliteration or conceptual uh, searches uh, do uh, currently. So it's a challenge. I'm told some of our colleagues in Slovenia uh, have uh, developed some technologies recently, and they are testing in that direction. So, but that's that's a challenge currently, and uh, uh, even in many languages we have this problem. So we are predominantly in that sense as of now is English language way, but that's that's what our job like the OER Paris declaration emphasizing on OER uh, in local languages the more lo local languages OER are created the more translation of uh, already existing English materials to different local languages uh, national languages happen the more it will be useful because the web is as we know today is more populated I think sometime back I did search it was 65 percent of dominated by English so it might be a little less now, but that's, that's a problem. For the next speaker, I think that is where your um, sort of the, the question that you raised also, can I contribute to OER? And that is sort of a challenge on each and every person who speaks another language than English to contribute to that pool of OERs in that specific language. And in that way, we will build uh, a repository of OER in specific in language. languages. So people should should maybe take the the, the course, the online course on, on OER and then get more confident and say, yes, I want to contribute. That is what I'm taking away from yeah. your presentation. In, in fact, what is happening that uh, people take some of our call resources uh, and translate it. See, that's another way of uh, improving understanding of promoting OER. Mm -hmm. I know some colleagues in Brazil and, and Peru uh, Chile, they uh, take our materials and translate in their own language. So I would suggest some people to uh, write in their local language about OER, educate others after doing this course or after doing the presentation. So that's a way of promoting. Great, thanks. Um, so Gita, you have also posted a question. I'm wondering if you could read it aloud. Oh, Sajida, are you able to respond? Sajida, can you hear us? Okay, I'll read it out with Sajida if you want to add anything, please let us know. So she had asked how I can control a my revised educational material once it is published on the internet. What do you mean the word retain? Yeah, um, once a material is released on the uh, internet um, or any other medium for that matter, and you are putting on a as a with a license or or I'll say open license, you don't have any control over that material. So somebody else takes it, uh, somebody else takes it, and um, want to create something else based on um, based on your um, your license conditions, okay? 
nobody uh, within your the license conditions that you have put it somebody else can do anything you will not be able to control that material in in that way but the retain means that uh, you know, if you have reused and re created a derivative work then you retain that materials to, to uh, for yourself this is also another uh, uh, interesting way that i present that um, in fact 4r is sufficient if i have to say retain is actually by default uh, is part of the license it's part when you are creating something you retain the rights to make whatever you want to do with that material so retain is by such a default in that sense but david willy is talking about retain from the context of uh, different formats that you are releasing on a, on a pdf you can take a print and you have it and you distribute the print as well so you, you retain in that context um, i'm a little shaky on retain so i would accept that because uh, i myself is not convinced uh, about uh, adding a five fifth r onto onto the four r previously on oer so 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 but you don't have real control once you release something on oer Okay, um, Mustafa, I see you posted another question in regards to Facebook, and I'm not sure if that was answered, so could you read that out loud? Thank you, uh, Ms. Senna. So, uh, uh, yeah, this question is uh, related to uh, the translation. So, if something is copyrighted, if I translate it uh, for my context, so, uh, Will it violate uh, the the copyright law in that case? I'm sorry, so yes. copyright matter. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I think I think that is why it's so important um, that I'm personally putting the challenge out there uh, for our partners to take the online course on OER um, because the only way to have control over these things is to understand it ourselves. So um, it is not, as was indicated by Sanjaya, it is not like weeks and weeks on end studying. It is very short, it is very much to the point, it is very user friendly. So it will help us. Um, and as we normally say, not only in this specific project, but that is a lifelong asset that you then have. It is something that you can practice and that you can use no matter where you are. And with where technology is going and where education development is going, um, I think it's a must have, uh, especially when we look at what, what are the benefits of OER, why do we need to use OER, why are we using OER, why are we propagating for using OER, one of the issues is broadening access. Another one is um, save money, it's less costly. So with all those challenges, I think uh, it is imperative that we consider empowering ourselves in this area. One of the questions I saw Professor Mustafa typed there is about use of Facebook photos. Now you upload photos to Facebook if these are, are these OER. Um, Facebook uh, terms of use have been changing quite a lot often. Um, when I became a member of uh, Facebook long time back, they were using a CC license very clearly on their website on the terms of use. Today they don't use the terms of license. Um, but what did they say is that when you post some photographs on the Facebook you are giving Facebook the rights to uh, reuse or do anything with that photos because you are giving them the full permission of that content to that uh, those materials uh, as long as you don't delete it from the website so that you have the privacy and freedom but those really do not become automatically OER as of now uh, previously yes it used to be on the CCBY. So I used to tell some of my colleagues, they used to write 
uh, put their photos and they you guys to they used to write ccby essay then i used to tell them oh see, by default it will be ccby so why are you writing ccby essay <laughs> but as of now it's it's uh, not everything that you post is your copyright so and you are sharing with others that means they can share it with others so they are not violating anything as long as you are sharing it public anybody shares it reshare it they are not violating copyright because you have made it open so it's your permission level that decides uh, whether it is oer or not so but other than that if i i am not shared and uh, and my contact is not francis is supposed is not in my contact in facebook and she takes an image from my things and print it somewhere else then it's violation of copyright okay but if she is on on uh, on my facebook and sharing it on facebook she is not violating anything so it's re reusing photos from facebook and other things we have to be very careful that not to violate the rights of the original person who has posted it perfect thanks so much and i see mustafa that you posted the link um the course understanding OER. So thanks for doing that. No, that's not oh, the right no, one. Not the right one. Yeah, uh, that's not the right one, uh, Professor Mustafa. If you click on this link, it, the link will ask you user ID and password. So I don't recommend to use this link. I would recommend to go to tell.colvee.org and and then click on the course understanding open educational resources. Perfect. And that's also on the slides and I can make sure everyone gets that information as well. Um, we are nearing the end of the time for the webinar. Awesome. So, oh, thank you, Axel. Thank you very much. That's my stuff on for a minute. Um, if anyone has any final question, now would be the time to ask it. Francis, did you have any? Yes. Um, I want to thank you, Christina. I want to thank uh, Professor Mishra, uh, Dr. Mishra and Sanjaya, as we know him. He really doesn't mind how we call him. Uh, so he's also a former professor of mine. Um, thank you very much, much, Sanjaya, for making the time to speak to us this morning. We know uh, OER is in your bloodstream. Uh, however, when one makes a presentation, you have to prepare for it, whether you are an expert or not. And we really appreciate the fact that you took time, despite your own very busy schedule and the demanding schedule that you have at this time with all the conferences happening, to sit down and focus on a presentation for Girls Inspire's webinar today. For us, these webinars, the monthly webinars, is a very important um, uh, item on our communications calendar because we want to ensure that each and every person we are working with has the tools to execute his or her task to the best of his or her ability. And we have identified all the various um, uh, dimensions of working on this project. Uh, and OER is a very important one because of the fact that we are developing learning resources in different contexts. And we have to be conscious of the fact that we are working with marginalized communities. And within that community, it is not always possible for us to print out or to buy a textbook or to print out uh, uh, materials because of the cost involved. So I'm very pleased that you have listed as the type of OERs, also videos, YouTube, etc. Because sometimes there is the perception that when we talk about OER, it's a book. It's something that you find online, it is a, a, a narrative, it is a text. Uh, that we also now have a better understanding that uh, OER is not only printed material, it's not only a narrative that's written down. There is a whole list that was indicated 
and uh, we we know that the session has um, illuminated some of the things uh, that was already there for people but in some cases it has given new information to some of us who didn't know some of the things and that is always very very helpful so I know the team uh, and all the participants, wherever you are uh, in this meeting, has learned a lot uh, from this um, session. And we will definitely make a follow-up on this um, in 2018, because we have the schedule already for this year. Uh, and part of that follow-up would be maybe to have one of the people who would have taken up the challenge to do this course to say something about the course and what happened after the course and say I've done this course and because of this course I have achieved A, B, C and D. So that would be not only useful for us and helpful for us as the Girls Inspired team but also for the Commonwealth of Learning and specifically for Professor Mishra in the work that he's doing to see that yes uh, more and more people are using this and we also want to encourage your colleagues to take this message uh, to your teams as you know Christina will send you in Basecamp the, the slides uh, but she will also send you the recording and the recording will be uh, on our uh, site where you can go back and you can bring the recording as we normally do I want to just remind you of that with your teams, let them sit down and let them listen to the presentation. Uh, and if there are more questions, we want you to go to the Community of Practice um, online uh, platform and write your questions there to Professor Mishra or connect with him on Facebook or on Twitter and post your questions there. But let us take this and uh, do something with it. Uh, as usual, we will also send you a post-webinar questionnaire to find out uh, anything that uh, you want to say to us about it and anything that you want to learn more in future about OER. Thank you very much, all of you, wherever you are, where you have signed in from Bangladesh. Superkash, I'm so happy to see you here today. I've spoken to you in quite a while. I see we have Tanzania, we have Pakistan, we have Mozambique, um, and we have Bangladesh. Do we have India? I didn't see India. Um, but we have the four countries that's um, part of the project, and I think we have people also here in Canada signed in. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'll head back to Christina for her final words before we close the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Princess, Dr. Misha, for the wonderful presentation. I'm going to end it now, and I will be sending out the recording and slides and additional information later today. Uh, and happy Eid to everyone that's joining us from Bangladesh and Pakistan. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Christina. Yes.